Hey, everybody, I want to welcome you back to the Think Great Experience. I am excited about today's show. We have author, speaker, consultant, longtime executive in the cruise and travel industries, David Giersdorf with us. David, welcome to the show. Eric, thank you. Uh, uh, hello to your listeners. Uh, thank you all uh, for having me uh, in your life at, for a few moments at this time. I really appreciate it. I think we need you in our life right now. Uh, we have had a lot of disruptions over the last two years, and I know that's a huge theme for you and your consulting company. Um, but I, I have to ask you the, the big question here. I mean, in the, in the cruise industry, the travel industry, there are some industries that got hit hard by the pandemic. And I would say that the cruise and travel industries were among uh, the top ones as far as the impact. What was your experience like working with people in the cruise and travel industries as this all started to go down and they were disrupted? Uh, indeed, the, this is a, these are industries that have been disrupted uh, often. Uh, it's the nature of the business being global, being interconnected, being subject to uh, geopolitical, economic, health, um, um, social you know, concerns all the time. So, <clears throat> but that said, this was the biggest disruption of all, and it ain't over yet, <laughs> for sure. Uh, the the impact, enormous, enormous. The 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 big cruise lines, the familiar names that that we know so well, uh, had to raise thirty billion dollars to get through a period of laying up their fleets, parking hundreds of ships worldwide not operating, uh, sending crew home, reducing headquarters staff, terrible in a, bus in a people business where relationships and, and people skills and culture are so important to, uh, so the disruption is more than an economic disruption, it's a disruption to a business model, a, a, a machine, a well-oiled machine yeah. that delivers day in and day out, 24 seven on every waterway of the world you know, to, to, to the standard, highest standards of people's dreams. So um, very emotional because of the connectedness of, of everyone worldwide who works in the industry and with their customers and their partners like travel agents across the globe. Very emotional, um, challenging. Uh, and um, I will say that because of the experience that the industry has gained in dealing with disruption, it was able to move quickly from shock into action and to get its priorities in the right place and to um, then navigate uh, this disruption through its different phases. And in fact, you mentioned my book. My book is called Hard Ships. Love navigating, <laughs> thank you, navigating your company, career, and life through the fog of disruption, because disruption does initially uh, obscure our view of the future and our view of what to do next. So um, I've had 40 years from the beginnings in an entrepreneurial family travel and cruise business to you know reaching some of the highest levels of executive position in the global industry. I've uh, led companies and teams through disruption I've had a number of disruptions in my personal life and career. We're rarely disrupted only in our company. It's usually right. multifaceted, <laughs> yeah. you know, multi-layered. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, therefore I thought um, I'm at the stage of my life where um, uh, drawing on past experience, finding a way to turn that into wisdom that can be shared and useful for others. Uh, I found that uh, this theme of disruption, uh, my playbook, my six protocols, for successfully navigating and recovering, and my one mindset, uh, the endurance mindset, would be as an endurance athlete who's learned a lot about finding the finish line. Uh, well, you've done, I you've done a lot. Of, you've done a lot of great things. Yeah, you've done a lot of amazing things. Um, one of the things that's fascinating is you started your own business with your family many, many years ago. That's one of your first moments of greatness. Can you describe a little bit about starting that business? Because you had the, the cruise lines, the cruise ships um, at, an, at an earlier age. So you've seen the whole industry evolve over many decades. But what was that like starting that business at an early age? Because I know that many people that listen to this show are entrepreneurs at heart. They, they want to know what it's like to start a business and how to run it successfully. Well, it's the proverbial 
uh, jump off the cliff, step off the diving board. Nothing prepares you for the full experience. You do build it as you fall. Uh, you build the parachute <laughs> on the way, right? It, it's that's yeah. real. Everything you hear about yeah. that is real. Okay, that's the thrill of it and the fun of it as well, and the challenge of it as well. Uh, so um, it was uh, all hands on deck, so to speak. Uh, my father was uh, an amazing entrepreneur, a AAA type personality, a huge creator, one of the most creative, uh, outgoing personalities, uh, with the with the power of his convictions, the willingness to take risks. And uh, obviously, I'm 15, 16 at the time. So when the my dad says, I'm leaving Alaska Airlines, I'm acquiring some of the <laughs> assets we've built, the tourism assets we've built in Alaska, and starting our own company, Alaska Tour and Marketing Services. And it's all hands on deck. Right? So I, uh, I went to school, but I spent my summers in Alaska working. Um, digging uh, tour buses out of snowbanks in the Arctic, uh, hiring and training, uh, you know, the tour, tour teams, dealing with the, the, uh, the logistics of customers coming to and from. You see, what we did was we had a big vision, and that was to open up the real Alaska, the authentic Alaska to tourism. So that meant being able to go above the Arctic Circle to the Native communities, learn about Native cultures, uh, the gold rush, on the Arctic coast in Nome, the Prudhoe Bay oil fields, very active at the time, the construction of the Alaska pipeline, so much learning. Then, or going out to the Pribilof Islands off the Aleutian chain, the Galapagos of the North, 180 species of birds, the, the, the North American fur seal herd summering there, a small Aleut community, um, Russian past, unbelievable. And then the National Park at Glacier Bay, we, we owned and operated the concession there for many, many years. Uh, the lodge, the boats, the, the touring to the glaciers to watch the giant calving of ice, the, the glaciology and, and the bears and the moose and the, and the humpback whales. Uh, so bringing all those experiences to life and making them accessible was a, took a huge commitment. It was very difficult. Without that big commitment, without the sure. eye on the prize, we would have never overcome uh, the obstacles to get there. Well, and you had a family business to boot. So there's there's some inherent challenges, some some blessings and challenges when you run the family business. Boot is the uh, <laughs> one of the operative words, bootstrapped, self-financed. <laughs> yeah. You know, that that's a real lesson as to as you have such a capital intensive business, especially when we started to build small cruise ships to further extend our concept deeper into uh, the waterways of Alaska and eventually all over the world. Uh, that that's capital operational intensive 24 seven. It's never ending. You know, I, I would, I was the cash guy. I was the guy who drove revenue for the family's business. That's turned out to be my forte. And huh. so I would hear from my dad and the CFO payrolls Thursday. We're short. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> you know, you're never more creative than when your back is to the wall. I will also guarantee that to your entrepreneurial listeners. And it doesn't sound like you had a lot of time to deal with that disruption that was placed on you. No, no. And, and in fact, I came by it. Honestly, I lived a disrupted childhood. My father was a single parent. Uh, he raised my sister and I. Uh, I was born in the frontier of Alaska before statehood. Uh, I was uh, raised by multiple surrogates because of my dad's busy life and personality. Uh, he, was, he had a lot of help. Let's put it that way, from, from the ticket agents behind the counters at Alaska Airlines, uh, hanging out in the hangars, <laughs> uh, uh, being flown, put on airplanes by ourselves and flown to relatives in faraway places like Panama and elsewhere just to make it work. You know? and, but it did work. I, I did develop a skill for uncertainty, adaptability, uh, disruption at a, long, at a very young age. And how long did the company exist for? Uh, at, until uh, into 80, we sold it in uh, 1984, 1986. Yeah. So we were, we were 15 years in uh, at that point. Um, uh, quite a good sized company for a privately held business. Uh, and that sale of the company was what propelled me into the then emerging global cruise industry. My expertise, in a small ship, highly experiential, 
uh, business uh, led quickly to an opportunity to be to run a, a boutique, a brand new boutique cruise line called Windstar Cruises, which is now quite a famous uh, yeah. and still existing. And I, I, I made the company famous as 180 degrees from ordinary. That was how we defined the experience. And that remains awesome. one of the longest lasting taglines in the industry. So from there up into the larger uh, world of Carnival Corporation, uh, and, uh, and from there into um, private equity and, you know, acquisitions and other things that revolve around uh, the cruise industry. So when did you form your consulting business then? Uh, 12 years ago. Okay. 12 years ago, and I wanted to get back to my passion uh, as the global uh, cruise industry grew in scale yep. and, and diversity um, and different segments of the business. My favorite segment has always been the most experiential of cruises, which are the smaller ships that go to the most interesting places, whether on rivers or oceans, uh, expedition cruising to the polar regions, uh, you, you know, um, going into the nooks and crannies of interesting coastlines such as Iceland or, or, uh, or Eastern Canada or throughout Alaska that big ships can't go and that airplanes don't easily get you to. So, so really unique experiences uh, on small ships. So what was the what was the consulting experience like for you as you started to realize that the pandemic was for real? And I remember so I'm a consultant as well. So I've, I've written some books. I, I speak like you do. And I coach businesses on leadership and sales and strategic planning. And all of a sudden, there was that moment in March, maybe even leading up to it, where we realized things are going to shift here, that the disruption is coming. But how did you step into that as the disruption started to happen and your clients are cruise lines? What, what was that experience like for you yep. as a consultant? The disruption was more sudden and abrupt for the cruise industry. You know, it, it unfolded, I think, a little more slowly for uh, many others of us uh, in our businesses. But in cruise, when you stop, when you push stop uh, on a $45 billion expanding uh, universe of, of business and commerce. Uh, that's a big, that, that, that's a big thing. So the first thing was just dealing with the reality of the stop. You know, how do we um, uh, prioritize the actions? Um, how, is this for a long time or a short time? If it's short, what are the actions? If it's longer, what do we need to be prepared for? You know, what kind of decisions need to be made here? How do we draw on our past experiences and what we know about this? And that's where some gray hairs come in handy and, <laughs> and some calm, having seen other major yeah. disruptions, 9-11 and other things yeah. that have hit the global industries. Um, it allows you to, to be a voice of calm and, and a sounding board for CEOs and their leadership teams. And indeed, I was that. Um, I was, I'm always thinking in disruption about the other end. I know from experience that uh, with the right mindset and, and decision-making, uh, you will come out the other side of disruption. Disruption ends and becomes next normal. It's a continuous cycle. So I'm always thinking about what does next normal look like in a situation like this? And what are the things where we're taking action that are going to cumulatively align and lead to the next normal, which is recovery um, as quickly as possible. I know for me, when I, when I coached clients through this, um, there's always challenges in business. So that, that's why we have clients. <laughs> we help them navigate these challenges. This happened to be catastrophic for many of them. It was, a, it was a humongous undertaking of just shifting to be able to stay afloat. We yes. coach a restaurant um, and they went from being packed every night to then all of a sudden close, then they could do takeout and then slowly ramping up. So, you know, I even found my own coaching style enhancing along the way of more navigating through, I would say that there was a tsunami, a tidal wave of challenges that we were facing. Um, and the impact it had on people was significant. And I found that whatever industry I was coaching, we were really getting down to helping people handle these. And I know that your industry must have seen a significant impact on people who were laying people off, people who worked in the industry. What was your experience like from a coaching standpoint, a consulting standpoint, as 
people were trying to relate to their people through all of this because they they obviously had to communicate messages and this industry got hit harder than most how how were you helping them to stay focused or have that mindset i know i know you talk about it in your book and your consulting but what were some key points that you gave them to stay focused through all this well communication is king frequency of communication yeah. transparency you're a human being as a leader it's okay to express your own uh, feelings and concerns as long as you're bringing to the table a plan of action, even if it's based only on what we know at this point. People gain confidence in honest, transparent communication. And even if you don't have all the answers and you can't tell them what the future looks like, you can say what you know today and what you're doing about it today. And it's an iterative process as you go through. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up. When I when I work with teams and I'll ask team members, I'll say, what's a what's an important leadership trait for you right now? And transparency comes up so much. Yeah. And I I feel that a lot of leaders that didn't know what to say just said nothing. Instead of saying, like you you just mentioned, right? There's that that honesty, that openness, the transparency of saying, we don't know everything, but we'll let you know as we find out it goes a long way. It does. It does. And I, I think another thing goes a long way. Um, a company that's grounded in purpose has always has something to come back to and to build upon, even in the worst of times. Purpose aligns uh, energy it, uh, and interest, and, it's, and it becomes a common language. So if we have a strong purpose, even in the midst of a terrible disruption, when we don't have all the answers, what we can do is relate to how our purpose uh, will um, help guide us through uh, these events and, and reground ourselves in our purpose and what we stand for and make sure that that is informing our thinking about the future. And, and also our purpose is to well done is timeless. So all of a sudden the short term angst of what's happening to us here and what's going to happen can also be cushioned a bit by, we're in this for the long haul. We're gonna do what's necessary to stay in this and to rebuild for the long haul. That's our commitment. And if we um, lose many of our valued team members today because of this event, you can bet we're more dedicated than ever to building back and recreating those opportunities. That's a big part of my work as a consultant. I, the, one of the things that drives me from a purpose, I'm determined to help the industry recover as quickly, build back those, uh, those lost job opportunities and those stalled careers and reignite that um, forward momentum. And that's a meaningful um, yeah. you know, um, purpose for me. I think people listening to you right now are getting the fact that you're purpose driven. And, and I talk about that from a leadership perspective. It's I look for purpose-driven leaders, not paycheck-driven leaders, because when, when events like this happen, you, you really find out who's who in leadership. You Very find true. out who's purpose-driven, yeah. You're absolutely right, Eric. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I, I think you're, you're right to hone in on uh, purpose. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I gave a, a talk recently uh, for the global cruise industry, and I was talking about, you know, disruption, uh, how we think about disruption, what are some of the key themes that I see coming out of this disruption? One is radical innovation, uh, yeah. which really I call the accelerant to the next normal. And the more, sooner you embrace uh, that, what's coming around the corner, raise your eyes up from the current challenge and see what change is coming, what opportunity and, and grasp onto it, the sooner you'll be pulled forward out of the disruption. The second thing is what I call uh, codependence. Uh, we're in this together. We'll get, we can only get out of it together. And if we really embrace that idea of partnership, empathy, uh, support, uh, working inside and outside of our companies in that way, then I think we create something called relationship capital, which I would challenge everyone to think about a bit. It, isn't it possible, and maybe in your own experiences, that relationship capital is everybody's tangible, every bit is scalable 
every bit as valuable as money in our businesses. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head because every business says they're in the people business, right? So I always ask business leaders, what's your greatest asset? They always say people. And we have to really prove that and we prove it through relationships. And you really found out who was who through all of this. And, and for us, we wanted to just be there for clients because we were all in that fog. You know, you mentioned the fog of disruption and we were all in this fog together and people lent a hand to each other to help out. Uh, we were doing, you know, for us, we, we didn't do anything out of the box new, but we started to take some things like webinars and we started to launch webinars that we were touching down on them a little bit or virtual. We were all touching down on virtual and then we pushed the throttle forward and yeah. took off in that. Um, you, you'll probably notice that I, uh, I'll i use a lot of aviation reference. I was an air traffic controller in the Marine Corps. Um, and then you'll use naval reference. So, but we're, we're, we're talking about the same things here and we're speaking the same language, but those relationships through this whole pandemic, we've forged relationships with clients that are so much deeper because we went through the challenge together. You know, uh, even conflict with a client, there's times when disagreement, misunderstanding, miscommunication occurs. I have always found that conflict successfully overcome strengthens the bonds. Strength makes for a, a, a better relationship and a stronger relationship. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the last... <clears throat> Oh, go, go right ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the last thing I was going to mention about the um, relationship capital. You know, I see these two key themes of disruption, radical innovation. The innovation is always the bigger the, the, the disruption, the bigger the innovation. How is it we got um, vaccines to market in a year when it had taken average 10 years for vaccines to be created? And the fastest ever was the mumps in four. Um, and that's a form of innovation, right? Yeah. So uh, of radical innovation. Uh, in in other areas, we see it so, and the 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 work at home, and all the tech that sprouted up to support and enable that and keep the wheels of commerce going. Radical innovation. So there's always innovation in response to disruption, yeah. and in that innovation comes opportunity. Yeah. Well, it's interesting now when when you you're coaching companies, they, according to Gallup, I read this study that. Um, I think it was within a month of the pandemic being declared by the, the World, World Health Organization, 62% of the workforce was remote. And that's, um, that's with almost little to no training or preparation. We just went. Yes. And, you know, even for our team, we had to have strong relationships internal with our own business to be able to rely on each other. And for people to step up and say, hey, I got this, because I certainly wasn't going to be the one taking Think Great <laughs> virtual. <laughs> I needed the help of... Jake and Sapphire, they were, they were on it and they made things happen. But, you know, it was um, as unfortunate as the pandemic is, there's, I always say there's opportunities right beyond that challenge. Yes. If you just step through them or make your way through the fog, so if you right. will. So right. And I feel that we're just such a, we're a tighter team now because of it. You know, those relationships have grown through disruption, as you say. You know, what's interesting to me on this point, um, we took into the disruption and the and the the re response you just mentioned work from home go remote our existing relationships our existing cultures as companies and the like and you know and that enabled us to have that link and 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 bridge that transition into remote connection uh, i wonder in the rebuild as companies are rebuilt with new employees um a, a, how um, how the if they remain in a highly remote yeah. uh, workforce environment, it require uh, new innovations and new skills in building culture and relationship. Oh, uh, you, you're so right on that because there are some definitive benefits of of remote. You know, our team is still remote, but it works for us. But we still yeah. know when to bring people back together. So we'll get back together. I always use some military terms, but um, we'll have our all hands meeting. And uh -huh. it's important to have that balance now, whereas we used to see each other on a more frequent basis. Now we don't. And so we have to incorporate that too. So it takes some out of the box thinking about how do you continue to maintain high levels of teamwork when you have higher levels of separation? I think podcasts are part of that, the whole thing. Oh. The, 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 they work. 
And I they think do. we'll see podcasts playing a greater role internal to companies in their yeah. in their communication and uh, and and uh, you know support internal and external. Uh, the last thing that I want to say uh, in terms of observations about disruption is that um, it's a premise, really, and that's that uh, the one thing that ties everything together, getting through the disruption, uh, codependence, innovation. Uh, we talked about before is a compelling purpose. And uh, people can't work hard enough on defining a purpose that they can communicate effectively, that they can demonstrate effectively, that they believe in, and that's bigger than themselves. And I use the example of a, uh, uh, an endurance swimmer um, named Louis Pugh. And Louis is n notably the UN ambassador of the oceans. He's very concerned about climate health and particularly the health of our oceans. And within that, he sees that the polar regions are the key to it all. Uh, his term is no ice, no life. Huh. Couldn't be more simple. And what does he do? He undertakes the uh, never before, previously thought uh, undoable, um, not doable, inhuman swims in Arctic waters, endurance swims, to call attention to his purpose. It's an amazing following. Uh, he raises tremendous amount of money to, to support um, you know, good work in the area. Uh, he just completed the climate swim, his toughest swim yet, six miles across the face of the Aleutian Glacier in, uh, in uh, Greenland. Uh, wow. Jagged ice, currents, winds, zero degrees Celsius water temps and uh, just in swim trunks. And uh, he, he did the swim uh, and his purpose is so compelling that he can prepare for such a thing and do it and align the world's attention around it. That's a compelling purpose. Well, you know, that, that's, a, that's a great point because you typically don't just jump into ice cold water without a purpose <laughs> and not swim six miles. I wonder how long it, do you know how long it took him to swim then? Well, he did it in segments over a few days because he gotcha. could only physically be in the water for so long at a time. Uh, I, I don't know the link, six days, maybe something like oh. that. Yeah. Well, I was feeling pretty good about myself until that story, David. <laughs> I actually, um, so I grew up in the Los Angeles area and uh, we moved out here to Minnesota about 10 years ago. And I know they have this thing called the polar plunge. So I've checked it out. And I always thought I would never do that. Uh, a very good friend of mine, Anita Drentla, who's on our podcast too, um, said, you know, you should do this with our team. And here's the cause that it helps out. So she gave me purpose. Mm -hmm. So the idea of jumping in a lake was ridiculous. It just doesn't make any sense. They carve, they carve a hole in the ice. Everybody jumps in. Doesn't make any sense. When she attached purpose to it, I signed up. And I just did it my second year this year. Now, good for you. Um, I jumped in and I was out in about five seconds. So I didn't do the six day swim. <laughs> But you're absolutely right. I feel that people need to be more purpose driven now than ever because there's also a fatigue that comes with all of these challenges and purpose recharges our batteries. So I, I love that you said that because more people need to be purpose driven and leaders specifically can use purpose to help guide people. And even when they're interviewing, because we're in the great resignation, as they say, mass exodus from the yes. workplace, yet people are struggling to find people. Um, I would recommend to anybody listening, do exactly what David's saying and add purpose, even into your interview questions. When you're talking to people, share your purpose so they know they're not just joining a job, they're, they're joining a crusade or a company or leaders with, with vision and purpose. That goes a long way these days. I think people need it now more than ever. The same advice to the person on the other side of that interview who's applying, they should be able to clearly, clearly express their purpose, where it connects, with their understanding of the company or employer's purpose and how one plus one equals three, should they be the chosen candidate? I think, yeah, it's not just looking for a job anymore. I mean, yeah. we're, I think one thing coming out of the pandemic, everybody did a lot of uh, self-reflection you know? you and where do I want to be when this is over? And to a certain extent, most of the hardest times, the lockdowns, the six feet apart, even the masks, are going away and hopefully won't come back, knock on wood. 
but now people are at that point that when I was thinking during the pandemic where I want to be, I'm, I'm there now. I have to make some decisions. In my yeah, re from reflection to action. I, yeah. I will say one observation here. Um, for folks uh, like yourself and myself, as we um, progress through our life and our career and our contributions in the world, our productivity, um, our sense of time changes. When you're young, time seems uh, endlessly renewable endlessly accessible, everything is possible in the horizon of time. Um, I think that many young people today um, had uh, a lesson we learn as we, as we age, uh, foisted upon them by the pandemic. This two years of limitation and shutdown um, created an understanding that indeed the, the ultimate um, currency in life is time, not money. Yeah, you know, it's that commodity you just can't get yeah. back. Yeah, and you know, it's it's about experience, not things. It's about engagement, not viewership. So I think the value of time has become present and forward for everyone. I know for me, um, I think a lot about time, and I think about it differently. I'm very, uh, I have a great deal of gratitude uh, for um, you know where I am in life and uh, all the um, contribution of others that made it possible for me to be where I am today. And I'm also very intentional about my life because of this understanding of not only the value of my time, the time I have left, but the value of the time uh, of all those people whose shoulders I stand upon, that, that, that the, the courage and the contribution they made to be able to contribute to my life and to propel me a little further forward down the path. And uh, so I honor that and, and, I, and it's very valuable. And, um, and I wanna use my time in a way that uh, makes me an excellent bridge. Uh, can I learn what came before? Can I add something to it? And can I share it with others such that they can start from a more forward position in their lives? And I think that's how we become a really good link in our individual chains of life how strong a link are you? You know, are you a weak link? Yeah, things just pass, life just passes through. Or as it passes through, are you doing something additive to life that's going to be beneficial to others? And I think that's, to me, I call it when people ask, what's your purpose? I'm a bridge. I'm the best bridge you ever saw. I learned, <laughs> I'm a seeker. I learn everything I can. I ruminate on it. I think on it. I apply my own experiences to it. I try to add some value. And then I pass it forward because I know that others will stand on my shoulders and I want to make sure that they can see further over the horizon than I did. I think it's so important what you're saying is to share that wisdom. And I believe right now, based on the last two years, there are so many people, even the younger generation specifically, they're open for hearing wisdom right now yeah. because everybody had their world rocked uh, through yeah. this. <clears throat> even, you know, I've got children. My daughter, who's 15, is a sophomore in high school and they went almost a year without seeing other students, right? They were, it was all virtual. And I could never have imagined anything like that back in our high school days. Of course, we didn't have virtual, but <laughs> we didn't even know what it meant. But their whole world was disrupted. I mean, there was that one graduating class that, you know, they didn't really have their graduation ceremony. They didn't have their proms. There was so much taken from them that we take for granted that I really feel that that intentional word that you use, and I love that word, being intentional, for leaders, anyone listening right now, be intentional about sharing wisdom because people are open for listening to new ideas right now because we had all the old things we took for granted taken from us. It's so important. You know, it takes courage to do that. It takes mm -hmm. courage to put yourself out there. You do it, it does. all the time as a consultant, as a value advisor, as a podcast host, as a writer. You put yourself out there and share all the time, but it doesn't come easy many People have the fear of critics, their own critic in their head, and the fear of existent or non-existent critics outside. And when you um, take an, an act to put yourself out there, to put your thought out there, your wisdom, your experience out there, uh, it's, it, it's not comfortable. You know, it, it, I mean, you, right. once you re realize how rewarding it is and experience how rewarding yeah. it is, it's, it's very comfortable, but 
in those first stages. So I think there's many people who are held back from sharing uh, phenomenal yeah. gifts because of a concern. And I would just say being intentional is also being courageous. Take that they do risk. go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Take that risk. You will be well rewarded. You will learn more about yourself. You will learn more about others. Um, and uh, the world needs it, as you say. And I think that going back to the relationship side of things, if you're not sharing, have, be, have being courageous about sharing a little bit more about yourself and your story, it's hard to really build those deeper relationships. What I, what I found is, and I encourage a lot of leaders to share more about their story, not just their business. Yes. The more they can share about their story, mm -hmm. the more people in their business and outside of their business, they want to know more. And that's really where that connection is. And I feel that those are great relationships, but you did touch down on a, a point with the courage. It's hard because you're not sure what people are going to think. Yes. And I know for me, when I first became an author, I was nervous. Well, first of all, I realized as I'm writing, I needed help with it because what was up here wasn't what was coming out on the page all the time. It made complete sense to me. But then somebody read it and said, well, what do you mean by this? And I was like, wow, how do they not know? Because it, it, made, it was so clear to me. So that process and the, the idea of sharing stories, um, people do sometimes give you feedback and, and it actually makes you better at sharing your own story, I felt. I don't know if you experienced that when you wrote your book, but I did. I, I had outside editing help that you, you can't, you're in an echo chamber talking to yourself when you're writing on your own. <laughs> so yeah. I, I benefited greatly from that being challenged, <laughs> yeah. being, being questioned and, and, you know, and, and outside perspective. Uh, I think um, also we're taught uh, to in business, right. To, to, to think and express our accomplishments in numbers. You look at, look at my resume. Well, I progressed from here to here in three years. I built this division from this many billion That's dollars right. to this many billion dollars. I, you know, it's all about that. And uh, we're not trained to tell the stories of our leadership, the stories right. of our creativity, the stories of our, of our contribution. And that's what really resonates and differentiates it's, and defines you. Yeah, I've, I've, I've told many business leaders that, yes, as a business, we, we know our numbers. We know revenue coming in, sales, new accounts. We know those things. The way we track our success is the impact we make in people. And, and the, biggest, the biggest metric we track is how many unsolicited testimonials did we get where people say, hey, you, you, you shifted my perception, you enhanced my life. And that to us is the biggest form of success. And, and yeah. yes, as a business owner, you want to have, have a strong bottom line, but you're absolutely right. It's that the way we gauge what those results are, you know, what could, could we take it up a notch in business and gauge it by something other than just, you know, the dollar sign. You know how folks sit in meetings and stare at the screen or the whiteboard at the revenue number, the revenue graph, uh, I, I look at it and I say, folks, revenue is an outcome. You're looking at the wrong That's thing. Right. It's an outcome. There's 27 things over here that <laughs> drive that chart you're looking That's at. That's right. You yeah. need to be looking over here at these 27. This is an outcome. The better you do those 27, the less you need to worry about this chart you're looking at on the wall. But just looking, you can't do anything about revenue. It's average of averages. You can't do anything about it, right? Just looking and say, we need more revenue. No, you need better outcomes from your key inputs. There's no doubt about it. Now, you have so much knowledge, so much wisdom, so much experience. At what point did you know it was time to write a book? Because a lot of people tell me, you know, they say, Erica, yeah, I'd love to get some help writing a book, or I'm thinking about writing a book. So there's a lot of people thinking about writing a book, but you actually took that action. What led you to say, all right, I've got the name, which is one of the greatest book names I've ever heard, Hardships. I Thank love you. that. Yeah. Um, but what was that moment like in your head where you said, all right, I, it, it's time? Uh, this book had a long gestation period. I um, copy wrote that name more than 20 years ago, Hardships. I, I had the idea of sharing at some point my experiences in this, this amazing industry and, and life that I'm grateful for. Um, and really the foundation of the book is the fact that I journal, I still do today. I had 40 years of journaling where I uh, reflect in my journals on my business life, 
on my role as a leader, on events in the world and in my company and in my own life and with my own children, et cetera. So I had a, plus I keep good records in my, in my work too. So, so I had a trove of content, you know, about yeah. that. And when the disruption, and if, of course, if you're thinking about writing a book, you're talking to others about it. You're telling people you think about writing a book. When this disruption happened, so many people unsolicited came to me and said, David, if ever there was a time for you to write that book, it is today. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, it's right. And this is a good time uh, to make, uh, to, to, uh, to be able to focus because things have been disrupted. So I can, you know, my, my schedule is different. My, my focus is different. And, um, and I want to make a contribution and time is, is uh, uh, starting to flow through my fingers like water and I can't figure out how to slow it down. So, you know, do the act. And so lo and behold, you know, a year ago, March, um, I was able to publish uh, Hard Ships and it's, uh, it's been well received. Uh, it's, I think for all the great um, comments uh, I, I get about the book, Honestly, I have to tell you, I got more out of writing the book than anyone will ever get out of reading it. Because, Isn't that an incredible experience? Yeah, it helped me um, um, consolidate my experiences and my expertise and my stories and my thoughts. It, you know, and that, that moved me forward as a person, as a professional, just the act of having uh, undertaken such a project as that and, and, and the opportunity to talk about it uh, ongoing afterwards is, you know, it's just, it's a growth experience. It really is. I feel like the book writing experience for me has been one where <clears throat> when I'm writing a new book, I have these thoughts in my head and the book is actually very therapeutic. And it also allows me to fine tune what I'm trying to say anyways. Exactly. Exactly. And that's been a huge, I'm writing, I'm writing another book right now. And as I'm writing it, you, you're finding ways to articulate it better. So for me, it's it's incredibly helpful. It's an exercise in delivering my own content better. Yeah. But I, I've become addicted to the book writing process. I really enjoy it because the clarity it gives. You know. I can tell that I have at least two more in me. I'm I was going to find ask. myself ruminating <laughs> yeah. about this. Hard it's like eating a chip. Two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like eating <laughs> chips. You never eat just one. You're right. always thinking of that next book. I was going to ask you about that. So I'm glad. Yeah, you, well, there's so much, you know, you have, you realize in the process that you have so much content, you can't put it all in one book right. and stay <laughs> on message and stay on task. I mean, we have these, these, you know, d deep lives and lessons and stories and, you know, a certain number of them support the premise of the book yeah. and, and the point you're trying to share or make others wait for the next opportunity. And I have a lot of stuff waiting for the next opportunity. Well, I know you're expanding the content that's in the book currently. You know, you're 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 reaching out to more and more people with that. Um, can you just touch down a little bit? I, your concept of the the six protocols is is huge, it, and it and it ties in with so much of what people need right now. But how did you come up with that? You know, that there's six protocols that people must follow well, or at least adhere to as much as they can. In reviewing my former uh, journal writing and reflecting on my actions as a leader in businesses of different types, I realized that I had a pretty standard, I had developed a skill set, an approach to dealing with uh, disruption and realized disruption is not just um, the unexpected, the, the oh. negative stuff but disruption stuff you do to yourself for good reason. It's disruption that is an opportunity that came out of nowhere that you had the courage and the, and the wherewithal to pursue. So disruption you know, is a, has many forms, but I realized that I had a way and that I was someone in a disruption that others look to for that um, navigation chart. Okay. And why is that? And it's because I had a play, I had in essence a playbook. So I thought, then let's get this organized. And I have, I identified six key uh, elements, what I call the protocols uh, to follow in a disruption event. Uh, and, uh, and I have them in the right order. 
that this is the order in which I approach. This is how I advise. It's what I do in my own life. And the first one is know your waypoint, right? When we're disrupted, often it means we've been knocked off our current path. And we're really committed to that path, especially yeah. if we're entrepreneurs, if we're strivers, if we're drivers, we're so right. committed to that path, right? We're into denial immediately. We're into fight it immediately, yeah. okay? But underneath all that, there's a truth about where you are right now. There's a truth, you know? Um, others may not want to share the truth with you. Your fault, your, your role as a leader is to discern the truth. What, what do your, what do your employees uh, want? They want you to fix it and get things back to normal as quick as possible. That's right. Okay, there's, there, there's lots of reasons people have um, when you're out seeking what is the truth, what's the real situation where it might be filtered. Your job is to cut through all that and get to the hard truth. Where am I at today? You know, a waypoint is a point on the compass. It's a lat, a lawn, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, an altitude. Uh, where am I exactly today? Not where I wish I was, not where I thought I was headed, not where I was yesterday. If I'm going to assess this situation, I need clear eyed truth. So that's the waypoint. I got another waypoint. I got to start from a, from a foundation of truth. I think people need their waypoint now more than ever. So many people have felt lost. Yes. I guess you could say lost at sea, which is even scarier, but People have felt lost and they need leaders to help them find their way again. You know, are how, you, oh you God, know, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, you know how you find, when you feel lost, you know how to find where you are? Connect the dots behind you. What were the steps that have led to you being where you are right now? That clarity helps you uh, uh, define your waypoint. It's, it's not the only answer, but it's a really important part of the answer connect the dots. How did I get to where I am right now? Because it just helps build an understanding and appreciation for uh, the waypoint. So as hardships become part of your speaking um, offerings to your services, are you sharing this book um, from the stage as well? Like as a keynote? Uh, I have, um, I was invited to um, keynote on this topic at the Global Cruise Industry Conference. Um, several months ago. Unfortunately, the conference went virtual and I did deliver the talk, but it was a virtual talk. Okay. Yes. Uh, I've had other invitations to keynote that I have not been able because of schedule and commitments to do, but I really look forward to speaking on this topic. And what's really interesting is I can speak about the, the book, the six protocols, the, the mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some great stories that support and give example and, and, and detail to the protocols, but there's so much more to it all. You know, there's an industry behind this, yeah. there's a life behind it. I just really look forward to a chance to um, build off of that and, and take it in a, a lot of different directions. We may have to share the stage at some point because I can talk about aircraft, you can talk about ships, <laughs> it would be pretty dynamic, right? That because would be good. Those industries, you know, as an air traffic controller, there were so many similarities in the amount of communication that was needed, the guidance that was needed, right? The, the, the flight plan that was needed. It was a team effort all the time. Nobody just oh happened to take a plane up in the air. <laughs> well, How about accuracy? Right. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, like some, okay, there were a few guys that did that, but they were promptly arrested when they landed. But, you know, we don't want to encourage that. Um, as a speaker, is are there things that are most rewarding for you now, now that you're sharing your message, you know, differently, even though some of it might be virtual, right? But on from a stage when you're when you're speaking, there that's that's a whole different ballgame than than writing the book. Cause I know some authors that never want to speak. Um, but here you are doing both. What's your greatest joy about your role now, especially as a speaker? Yes, I would say the um the word is impact. Um, speaking allows me to share my message with more people um, and to share it personally where the book uh, cannot or, or yeah. the, you know. So, and, and to, um, uh, in talking about the book live with people, I get to see the, uh, and experience the, the, the human impact, the, 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 the nodding of the heads, the wrinkling of the brows, 
the laughs. Uh, so that is very, very rewarding, knowing that the, it's landing and each time learning from the audience what resonates and what doesn't and what contributes the most. So there's a, you, you get better because of that, because that feedback loop. Yeah. Well, it's the speaking, the speaking industry took a big hit during the Indeed. pandemic too. You know, I was, uh, I was probably doing a hundred different keynotes or even workshops. And then, then I've got the whole coaching side. So my schedule was packed. In fact, it was packed for a year and a half and the pandemic hit and we slowly watched the, the code word was postponed. Everything was postponed. Yes. Um, but luckily we have a great team and we went virtual. So much of it got to stay on the books just in this platform, but that industry, it caused everybody to take their game up um, a whole nother level, being able to stay relevant. You know? Events, conferences, yeah. business gatherings. I mean, what a, what a mess. It'll, it'll take a while. We just hosted a, a Think Great event. We had a bunch of sponsors here in the Minneapolis area and we had 250 people there. And That's it was amazing. And, you know, it, some of the people that attended, they said, this is the first big event they've been to in over two years. And, and you know, 250 isn't the biggest event, but for current times, having 250 people in a room um, was refreshing and people were very excited and the energy was flowing and we're repeating it again in June and we'll probably have close to 300 people at that one based on the room size. But it was fun to see people come back together and I think just like these messages that you're delivering, the ability for people to gather again is so important, so oh, critical. Good. You know, this, uh, I'm an endurance athlete. I mentioned that to you. You look yeah. like a pretty fit individual as well. But uh, I, I really went at it hard uh, earlier yeah. uh, as an Ironman, uh, multi-Ironman, uh, and every type of endurance event. And um, I still go at it this Sunday. I ran the first live event of two years in my hometown here of Bend, Oregon. And uh, that was the uh, Bend Marathon half marathon. So I ran the half awesome. marathon as a tune-up for a season, hopefully, of uninterrupted events of trail racing, bike, uh, biking events, and duathlons and the like. So, But I will tell you, after two years of no events, the joy on the athletes' faces, the yeah. emotion, the turnout for the event was fantastic. It was 30 degrees, icy roads uh, start, but I will tell you, everyone was so appreciative yep. of the ability to do it. And They're hungry that, for it. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's, I'm sure is similar across so many, so many uh, event uh, and, uh, and community uh, gatherings. You know, I just have to say, I, I love your passion for what you do. You are so extremely genuine and authentic, and you have this energy, this experience, this believability. Um, I can see why you're building up a big following. I can see why people love your book, want to hear you speak. Um, I think you are needed now more than ever. And, uh, and I'm just so grateful that you invested some time with us today. This has been amazing for me. And I, and I just wanted to ask is if somebody is listening right now and they would like to get a hold of you, learn more about what you do or uh, invite you in for a speaking event, how, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Well, there's really two simple ways. If someone is on LinkedIn, they can find me easily, connect with me, follow me. I'm happy to do it. I'd love to benefit from their thinking as well uh, through shared experience. So uh, David Geersdorf on LinkedIn. And the other is davidgearsdorf.com is a good place to uh, see some of my articles and, and find ways to connect with me. Uh, the book Hard Ships is available on Amazon, um, Kindle, audiobook, softcover, hardcover, and a really simple link, www.gethardships.com, take you straight to the Amazon landing page. Uh, so those are, those are some uh, easy ways to uh, track me down my company. Uh, web address, global voyages group, all one word.com is the other. So thank, thank you for that, Eric. And I look forward to, uh, uh, I believe in karma, you know, you could get back way more than you give. And I always try to make myself available uh, to others. Uh, and uh, I benefit as a result of others doing the same for me.
Well, we just appreciate you have, having some time to come on the show today, make an impact with our audience. And uh, I hope that we're able to team up on some projects because I think we could make some waves. Maybe that's what's what fun. we're going to call it. Yeah, making waves. <laughs> yeah. We'll fun? make some waves. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, David. And oh, go good ahead. For you for, well, and again, just gratitude to you for uh, the contribution of, of your show and your platform. The energy, if folks would appreciate the energy and commitment that requires uh, to, to create what you've created and to be able to put it out into the world. Good for you. Um, well, I have a feeling as you do your other books, we're going to have you back on so we can get a snapshot of what you're going to be uh, sharing with the world in those books. But, you know, we love having great people with great stories, great messages, making a great impact. And you absolutely did that. So thank you so much again. We appreciate you. You bet. Thank you, Eric.